Our mise-en-scene is vintage and focuses heavily on the difference between good and evil, light and dark. One of the first things you notice in the title sequence is costuming. Our killer is dressed in darker clothing. She also has darker hair and darker makeup. This represents her evil nature and also highlights her immoral actions in poisoning her friend's drink. Our victim is dressed in lighter clothing. She also has dirty blonde hair and little to no makeup on. This represents her good nature and her innocence. Their coffee is different colors as well. The killer's coffee is dark and bitter, symbolizing her darker nature and her bitter personality. The victim's coffee is light and sweet with lots of cream and sugar. This symbolizes her sweet and good personality. The coffee shop is also very light with warm colors and mid to high key lighting. It contrasts with the killer's actions, creating an ironic scenario in which not everything is as it seems. This is different from most horror movie settings where many films are located in an isolated area. This may be a country house, abandoned warehouse, or an undisclosed location kept secret. We decided to do a public area to defy this convention. This shows that once again, not everything is as it seems and that even communal places can be very dangerous. The victim's house is very dark with low key lighting and cool colors with the exception of the red blood. This is more in line with location conventions. The victim is isolated in her house where she meets her untimely end. Blood is commonly used in horror films, shock value, and because of the color symbolism, red can represent anger and danger. Our cinematography is very simple. We have many aerial and pan shots. The pan shots and the occasional tilt shots are mostly to establish setting, but they are also used to establish the relationship between the two characters. The pan shots reveal the two characters seemingly getting along, with the victim laughing into a cup of coffee and the pair talking over a cinnamon roll. One of the aerial shots we used was an aerial pan over the two characters eating in the cafe, which displays both their costuming and their props, sim signaling the light versus dark symbolism. Another aerial shot used is during one of the insert shots, showing the victim's bloody body. This is when the impact of what the killer has done really hits the audience, when they realize that the victim was indeed killed by her friend. Part of editing was choosing the titles for the sequence. Horror movies typically use bold fonts with block letters or dripping words. We felt by using those fonts, we would be ruining the aesthetic of the title sequence. We instead chose a delicate cursive font that was more in line with the general aesthetic and color scheme of the title sequence. In the last shot of the title sequence, however, we do use a more blocky font to show that the title sequence is still indeed in the horror genre. We also used parallel action in the form of insert shots. The insert shots are based off of the Mindhunter's title sequence, which has insert shots that are shorter than ours. The parallel action tells two very important stories at once to progress the plot forward. When planning, we originally wanted strictly non-diegetic asynchronous sound as a soundtrack to the title sequence. Later on, we planned for diegetic sound both on screen and off screen to create a more realistic feel and sound. In horror films, sound is used to create a frightful experience by amping up suspense with eerie music or surprising viewers with a sudden loud scare. In the title sequence, we use music to signal that something is off, like a horror movie might do. Our foley sounds perfectly normal and innocent, and the song we use sounds nice and vintage until you listen to the lyrics. She repeats the phrase, I'm sorry, many times, which isn't something you would normally hear in a usual vintage movie. Then, we accompanied the insert shots with brief static bursts, disrupting the song and surprising the viewer unpleasantly. It creates a very disconcerting feel as the viewers are left wondering what that shot was as they increase and the viewers left with a very unpleasant and comfortable feeling. Usually, representation in mystery is limited. The only character development we see happens to the detective who valiantly solves the case and possibly his dainty love interest. The murder suspects get limited character development and they're usually pushed to the side even though they are pertinent to the movie's progression. In addition, the detective is almost always a straight, white, older man with a delightful mustache. His love interest is a white, straight, usually younger woman that is positively irresistible. The murderer is most likely a white butler, though they may also be someone close to the victim. If a character is gay, 
they are either the victim or the murderer. If a character is a person of color, they are most likely a suspect, a victim, or the murderer. In horror movies, protagonists are straight, white, and disproportionately male. In many cases, black and gay characters are the first ones to die. That way, a movie studio can claim diversity and then do as they please. The murderer is often an older white male with mental health issues that lead him to kill. Both of the genres don't really focus on what the killer feels. They try to dehumanize the killer, make them seem like an irredeemable monster who has no conscience or feelings. In some cases, that is correct. In vintage movies in general, men are typically the strong characters, while women get weak representation and character development due to the prejudices of the time. They're usually displayed as faint, weak, and dainty women who can't handle anything that's not homemaking. Or they're displayed as a seductress that pulls good men off the good path. When we planned our title sequence, we wanted to do two female friends with no discernible male leads. That idea already flipped both mystery and horror on their heads. We did, however, want to exploit the stereotype of female rivals or frenemies. By using this stereotype, we could effectively give our murderer a motive and set up her character development for the rest of the film. As our killer is a teenage white girl, we challenge the usual killer mold present in horror films. At first, my research was kind of erratic. We hadn't really figured out our branding yet, so I was mostly looking for movies that were similar in technique, but not genre or style. I started with Get Out because originally we wanted a satirical horror movie matching Get Out's general style. It challenged societal norms and its genre's conventions by reversing the racist tendencies of horror movies and making a black man the protagonist, as well as exposing racial biases that have been ingrained in the horror genre in society. We wanted to do something similar with Sickly Sweet. We exploited the tendency to pit two female characters against each other with the murder of one character, but then use that as a stepping stone for the continuation of the story, where the murderer explores her feelings of guilt, regret, and loneliness. I continued with movies like Wilson and Lord of the Rings, where I touched on their choice for filming on location and our choice to do the same. As we, came, as we became more confident in branding our title sequence as vintage mystery horror, I focused more on movies that had a mystery element, mainly Agatha Christie movies that were both vintage and mystery. I tied Murder on the Orient Express to Sickly Sweet because of its traditional use of mystery genres and how it stacked layers upon layers of meaning on top of a simple murder. I also used And Then There Was One because of the way it built tension as people were killed off. I wanted to see if we could use this kind of tension in the title sequence to draw our audiences in. My researching in general became more methodical as I switched my focus from establishing the themes and branding to tropes in the genres and how to shoot and edit the title sequence. We chose A24 as our production company because we wanted to go independent and A24 had produced similar films to ours. A24 has produced films such as Krisha and Under the Skin, which are both thematically similar to ours in the sense that something isn't right, as well as exploring what it means to be human. A24 is a place where people can go to create indie movies free from creative suppression. We plan to platform our film, only releasing to a few theaters in big cities and spreading only if the response to the film was good. We also considered film festivals and decided on Sundance and the Cannes Film Festival. We decided that even though we wanted to platform in theaters, entering our film in prestigious film festivals wouldn't hurt our film, especially if it got in. When thinking about how to market our movie, I wanted to focus more on the main character of the movie, our killer. The marketing would hit at her guilt and her internal conflict while constantly referring back to the murder itself, leaving just enough suspense to hook potential viewers into watching the movie. We would definitely release teasers and commercials as well as posters for the theaters we plan to release in. Our target audience is those in their late teens and young adults probably from about 13 to 25. I would probably rate our film PG-13 because of the scenes of the murder itself and the heavy themes planned throughout. The film deals a lot with the struggle after committing an unspeakable act, which may include depression, attempted suicide or self-harm, and heavy guilt. The death scenes, while brief, contain blood. Despite this, 
I personally believe people would watch our film because of the way it takes a good look into, mo into emotions like guilt, regret, and loneliness. It sheds a light on the human condition and why we act the way we do, as well as becoming intimate with a self-proclaimed villain and seeing her perspective on why she killed her friend. It allows audiences to make the connection that humans are both good and bad, that there is no clear-cut good person versus bad person. At the beginning of this class, I knew absolutely nothing about filmmaking. I knew how actors generally contributed during production, but not much else. As I learned about mise-en-scene, cinematography, editing, sound, and more, I started to really appreciate filmmaking. I have become a better filmmaker because of all the things I've learned, both practical and theoretical. When we made music videos in class, we learned the hard way to take multiple takes of scenes and definitely plan ahead in editing beyond very simple storyboarding. I learned that editing takes time, skill, patience, and a lot of caffeine. Through our blogs, I learned that although it didn't seem like it, research is a very important step in planning a film if you want it to have meaning and depth. I learned how to record sound and to work around planning mishaps and technical failures. Most importantly, I learned how to rely on a team to help pull this all together and create something that I hope is worth all the stress and pain. I learned a lot about the process of making films. I didn't realize just how much brainstorming and research we had to do before we even had a solid idea we could proceed with. Thankfully, we had started out with a script from last year but we modified it so much that it's almost unrecognizable. There was so much research. I looked up so many things from common genre tropes to locations to representation. I had a lot of fun brainstorming with my group though. Shooting was a mess. I did learn that it, there is such a thing as too many people supervising filming. I also learned that improvisation happens more often than not. Like when we used about six cell phone flashlights in lieu of actual lighting equipment. In the end, I learned that editing is extremely hard and I appreciate anyone who does it for a living about a thousand times more. There's so many things that can go wrong from the file saving as unopenable or the title somehow managing to be completely different in every way every time you do something. During planning was probably the time I was most useful to be honest. Joey and I came up with the idea to use a script we wrote last year for theater. It was really easy to sit in a circle with my groupmates and just brainstorm ideas for the title sequence based off of that script. I was the one who came up with the idea for many of the sounds used, and I also contributed to developing the theme critically during the project's early phases. I was the one who suggested a more mystery feel, and I helped coordinate the, the festival release plans with my group's platforming desires. During shooting, Joey, Emily, and I coordinated props and also talked with the other people in the cafe to make sure they were okay with their faces on camera, as well as talking to the staff to make sure it was okay to actually film at that location. We bought the coffees and the cinnamon roll used in the cafe scene and helped film the establishing shots inside the shop. I helped smooth out technical problems during editing, and I also recorded sound with Joey using both the library and an empty classroom to get the static and police siren sounds. I recorded the sounds off of a laptop as well as recording ambient chatter. I was a sound editor slash producer, so every sound that Joey recorded was reviewed by me and I made suggestions for more clean sound when needed. I will leave the class a more skilled, knowledgeable filmmaker because of all that I've learned and experienced in making this project. I have learned that mise-en-scene, while it may seem trivial, is extremely important in developing the characters in the story. Our mise-en-scene in particular was meant to draw a line between good and evil as well as establish typical stereotypes seen in teenage girls. It also contributed to the vintage branding with a very soft, warm look in one scene and a cold, dark look in another. Although I struggled with cinematography in particular, I learned how different camera movements create different meanings in the different contexts of situations. For example, we use tilt shots and pan shots in our scenes to establish setting and character, but also to reveal betrayal and the consequences.
We used a Nikon D3400 to film in the coffee shop and an iPhone 7 to film the insert shots. We also used a camera stabilizer during the shooting at the coffee shop. Editing was done on a MacBook Pro with iMovie. An iPhone 6 was used to record fully. For lighting, we used various phone cameras, mostly iPhone 6s and iPhone 7s, and we saved and transferred our title sequence using a flash drive. I learned that researching the equipment before you use it is very, very important. I also learned to be prepared. The camera we used was at low battery, so we had to use an iPhone 7 for about half of the filming, and as a result, the film quality was very different iMovie also presented a challenge for us. Whenever Nicole tried to save our file, it would not save to the desktop and would be deleted when she logged out. She switched to a MacBook Air, but the file would not save to the flash drive or it wouldn't download completely. We finally switched to a MacBook Pro and the process became smoother. In editing itself, iMovie was difficult and that it was hard to properly use text boxes and fonts as they shifted and changed every time we did something different. We also didn't allot enough time to edit, so everything was rushed, and every problem we encountered was ten times more frustrating. Recording sound was not much of a problem. We recorded sounds in empty rooms that were silent, both off the computer and made by us. One problem we had was because we used voice memos, an app on iPhones, the quality of the Foley was slightly fuzzy instead of clear. The way we fixed this was by enhancing it in iMovie. We also managed to make some sounds softer using iMovie.